and welcome everyone to the KCP community meeting, August 10th, 2021. Uh, we have some topics carried over from last week. I think topics that we need to carry over from last week to, if you think of something we had on the agenda last week and didn't talk about, uh, by all means, bring it up. Um, but I also wanted to give some updates about how we're thinking about controllers can work in a multi-cluster uh, or in a you know KCP logical cluster multi-cluster scenario. Uh, and Clayton added uh, a rundown of the policy investigation. Um, let's which one should, where should we start i think one thing that i wanted to talk about last week that i don't think we went into enough was the whether we should reuse node selectors versus of, lo, of location selectors i don't know that it's settled at all i think clayton you tend to seem to prefer reusing node selectors and sort of assuming that clusters have the same uh, physical clusters have the same labels as all nodes within those clusters. I think that's a fine assumption. We can definitely not lock on it and keep going. Uh, it should, you know, we don't need to solve that to be able to make progress and, and have better and better demos. But I, yeah, and there, I mean, because it's node selector is the simplest of the options. Then you have pod affinity, pod anti affinity, service topology, as well as um, tolerations. I'd probably say that. And we were like talking about principles. Um, we didn't actually, I don't know if we brought um, principle of least surprise actually out in the overall principles and goals doc, but I think it probably belongs there. And so it'd be a, if you had to invent a new system for doing new things that made, that was completely different than cube. I mean, a, a cluster is just a set of nodes. Um, and then maybe like the question would be uh, within a cluster, the kinds of flexibility is like cube kind of has like an o10 cardinality for like chunks of nodes like most people have two sets of nodes or three a few people just have one set um, maybe like single node clusters or a few of the cloud infrastructure providers that run the control plane elsewhere most on-premise deployments have at least two or three categories of nodes and then um, a certain set of you know i've certainly seen this like you might have like four or five different policy domains within a cluster for different types of nodes, nodes by infrastructure type, like if they have um, GPUs, um, DMZ versus not DMZ is common. So there's kind of a low cardinality of chunks of nodes within a cluster. Um, it's certainly reasonable that placement onto physical clusters is gonna also have low cardinality, but not you know singleton cardinality. Like there may be lots of really good use cases to say, I wanna expose two different chunks of capacity from a physical cluster place onto which have different policy constraints and so yeah you could you could probably make up some things like either all of those nodes have a consistent label in which case placements kind of or similar tolerations or similar taints and similar labels would a reasonable user expect those if you wrote your own system um you'd effectively be duplicating those and so i, I think like just all other things being equal we'd want a reason to do something different and the reasons would have to be like justified in terms of um, we're surprising a user by inventing something new that has a cost. Therefore, there has to be a justification for it. You're uh, off. You. you briefly were. Now you're off. The AirPods just sucking again. Uh, we'll see how long these last. Um, the the I wasn't. Uh, I don't necessarily. I, I definitely don't want to invent new concepts because there are enough of those already and n plus one concepts is going to just be more um but i was thinking of re of basically copying the existing concepts of node selectors affinity uh, uh you know constraints and taints and things and making them the same concepts at the location layer instead of the node layer I, I, again i don't feel i don't feel strongly and i definitely don't feel strongly that we need to answer it soon i mostly just wanted to get people's thoughts on wh which yeah. one of those is less surprising, right? I agree that we want to surprise people the least. I think I'm not if, sure whether it's If we're talking more or less specifically about transparent, is it more surprising to have to do something that's different or to be transparent? So I would say at that point, the moment you have to add those is not transparent anymore. And I see what you're saying. So, so uh, if I'm saying send me to a cluster in 
you know, AWS or send me to a cluster in a better example than that. This deployment should be spread across at least two availability zones is a, is a common, you know, we think common use case for, for this. First of all, it's not completely transparent because you have to have the concept of locations in the first place. But then to be able to schedule those, we want to say it's like you have a single global cluster where some nodes are labeled east and some are labeled west or some are labeled Amazon or some are labeled. Well, in every node in every cube cluster implicitly gets a zone and a region label. Those are part of the Kubernetes API uh, contract. Um, on all cloud providers, unless someone takes an action, those are also implicit. So there is an argument that um, it's already an official part of the Cube API. And indeed, on premise, you know, expect, you're expected to use the region and zone labels as because we actually have default spreading on region and zone labels. And so region and zone are actually two really good examples of if you want to do zone spreading, the expectation is you would use the zone label. And if you were to expect behavior within a cluster to behave a certain way you would expect one thing and then you would probably expect that to be consistent about uh, some of the other labels might be like um, grouping policy that's not uh today you would have to put those labels on nodes to get those rules enforced and so that and you would have to change your workload to target them so there's already kind of like that implicit built-in assumption that to target you have to use labels of nodes and then it really just comes down to yeah like is there's certainly no rule that there has that um, a location has to be a homogenous pool of nodes, um, and so then it'd be like, what's if we put if we require something net new it is guaranteed orthogonal, but now it is um, you cannot mix node and location labels, and so you'd have to you'd have to answer both of those how they fit and how you mix them. Whereas if you just have the one, um, you have to figure out how they're consistent, and you have to be. You have to obey that consistency, but you don't have to add to it. Um, so another example, you, you said something that was really important, I think, um, and this kind of ties back into it. Uh, Jessica and I were having a conversation earlier today. She was kind of helping me go through the policy and the self-service stuff. And we were talking about, um, you know, a logical cluster is a tool. There might be different implementations of logical clusters. Um, it's a very reasonable to say like, oh, I could create a CRD that in one logical cluster results in other logical clusters. So there's a special logical cluster that's like the default or an admin that's always there. And then I can make up, uh, have an implementation that exposes logical clusters based on the presence of CRs. And then we were saying, um, but there, the concept of a logical cluster, like cube clients can only talk to logical clusters. The cube API space stops when you hit the cluster scope. You can't go outside the cluster scope. There's no way to post to an API outside the cluster scope because the cluster scope is how you post to something outside the namespace. There's nothing else. And so one of the things that we were kind of just going back and forth on was avoiding the need to create two new concepts or a net new concept for a place to put a policy API that applied to logical clusters, which is if you want the cube clients to work, you have to create them with inside you have to have an API with inside a cluster like concept. And so what that proposal was, what we were kind of like walking, about was like, yeah, we could go create arbitrary rest APIs, but clients wouldn't know how to talk to them. So you've effectively created a new system that nobody knows how to work with. Um, and that you can do that. And there's not like, we do that all the time. Every programmer out there creates tens of APIs before breakfast. Um, but the power of the concept would be if you create those policy APIs and the clients work with it and that you can come up with a way that that's not surprising to a user, you have, you have avoided the, the action of creating a hierarchy above clusters, which means um, all of your existing concepts work and a few of them might have friction. So this comes into the, you know, not everything that's inside a workspace, like let's call it a logical cluster, you have a CRD for it. And you also have logical clusters that show up um, if somebody wanted to change that logical cluster CRD, or they wanted to add new policy objects, um, reasonable people could disagree, but no one changing those concepts had to invent a higher level system, like a higher level co concept scope for the API resources outside of cluster that other people to work with. So it's kind of like you're, there's a, there's a 
cognitive complexity and an implementation complexity. So we, we were calling it like the rule of parsimony. And we were like, this might be a principle that we would actually say, which is the goal here is to work within the constraints of the existing client ecosystem. Uh, don't invent two APIs where one will undo, where one will do, don't invent one API where zero will do. And it kind of plays to a principle of least surprise as well. So we, we were seeing something similar to what you're describing here and the trade-offs here in the policy side as well with uh, logical clusters. Really off-topic question, but I think it could uh, uh, it could be useful. Is there a good, whether uh, probably not official uh, support or or official way to do this, but a good way that people have seen for describing a singleton object in a cluster. Like this is the only one that exists in the cluster, the only one that can exist in this cluster of this type. You could do it with like there is a policy type, you know, a policy CRD and one resource called policy that is cluster scoped and then have admission controllers that reject other named objects. But yeah. I, I, is that the best we can do for a like single yeah, and, single and cluster actually, scoped object? And from a design perspective, we've repeatedly said don't use cluster scoped objects or don't use singletons um, when it would be better to make composables. And there's a few cases where it doesn't. I can think of like four or five examples where all practical things you only look at the you only look at a predictable name. And yeah, you could have a webhook emission. I mean, honestly, we could go add that for CRDs if we really wanted to. It was the um, it's not a common enough use case for singletons and, uh, but I do think it would come down to, um, uh, most of those are containers looking downwards. So picking a singleton at the cluster scope, it, if you can cut a lot of use cases that are singletons could be modeled as multiples or you just ignore the multiple. And so it kind of came down to you really need to block someone. How often does someone accidentally create the wrong name? And it's actually very useful sometimes to be able to create one that nothing's going to look at that does validation. That was before dry run. So that arguments faded a little bit. Um, but there were there's certainly use cases of like, here's a bunch of them. And then uh, there have been places where people started with singletons and added more. Um, since you always have to provide a name no matter what to a cube API, uh, the thinking of the protection against other names is really more of a validation rule. So you're widening validation if you decide in the future you do want multiples. And so it was kind of like uh, we couldn't come up with any use cases for core cube, uh, but definitely people in the ecosystem have used the singleton pattern with webhooks. Yeah, but, but in, in OpenShift, you have a, a number of config objects that are, you know, singletons, just a name cluster. And it's never it's never been an issue where someone's like, man, I really want to block yeah, creating more than one of these. Um, just, there is some confusion, and certainly convention was important. So things like pick a consistent name for related yeah. objects mm -hmm. that are all singletons. So if you have one global config object, um, now uh, the biggest challenge I actually think with those singletons <clears throat> is in the multi-cluster context. There are actually legitimate use cases where you want to tie those into, mm -hmm. you know, to make those multi-cluster, which would tend to make them namespace scoped. Cube definitely did a, a better to err on the side of namespace scoped over cluster scoped, but then that gets into uh, you know permissions and all of that. So I, I think it's a most people most of the time want namespace scope resources. Most people most of the time don't want singletons. Enough people wanted singletons that there's a kind of a pattern that people could follow, but not enough people wanted singletons that there was a reason to go improve uh, the use case more best uh, implementation of a singleton is convention, well, well conventioned name and maybe admission webhooks to block other things and other names being created. The but that's, beauty, that's the best we have. The beauty of the controller pattern is it's assumed that the controller is the source of truth about which one is authoritative, not the API server. Yeah. The confusion, and again, another aspect of it is your controller could very easily fill out status that says I'm ignoring this or your status or your controller could just not fill out the status. It usually came up with objects that didn't have status. It was a little bit weirder. Um, so someone, for instance, was proposing singletons for like cluster name. Um, 
that got proposed. And I kind of don't like that because that assumes that a cluster only has one name. In some use cases for multi-cluster, it does. And in others, it doesn't. So mm -hmm. your, your, your resource type itself is already defining a set of implicit rules about how that type is used. Um, because the controller is the one who implements it. So it, it didn't feel like it was that big of a burden to just pick a convention. I actually think a couple of other systems with singletons, you still have to name it a certain way. Like um, in Rails, there was a similar system where you still had to name it a certain way. You didn't get, you didn't get out of having a name for the singleton. Uh, many things, potentially many things that use this pattern, but not enough to have a single, like, holy blessed way to do it. Everybody kind of does it their own way. That's that's fine. That's more or less what I expected. Um, and so, yeah. And singletons, historically, um, singletons actually start making more sense if you have a layer above the cluster. Because a lot of the use cases where singletons fall down are, is this the only way that you're ever going to use a resource with this name and this schema? And the answer has historically been people find you, like even quota, right? Um, the quota resource is generally, generically usable in other contexts. The pod resources, the template specifically is reusable in um, workload controllers. Um, secrets are actually potentially valid. People have invented cluster secrets um or reference secrets in namespaces from cluster scoped resources to allow things like um, a secret that all nodes mount through a csi driver right because almost every organization i'm aware of kind of has global policy organizational policy and then mm -hmm. local policy uh, team or individual and so uh cube does okay at global policy in some resources um, like rbac but other things like secrets you know I want every workload to have access to this proxy server is a, you know, is a, is a construct that we never modeled in cube. And so, you know, certainly folks, I, I know several different projects in the ecosystem that have built things like that, um, CSI drivers or um, CSI drivers make it easier before we had, you know, some injection at the node level, uh, pull sequence are kind of like this. Um. Great, thank you. That is that is uh, helpful. I wish there was a better way to model this, but the one that we have is seems good enough. Uh, if we decide to to within the bounds of transparent multi cluster, I think I think that's the caveat. That's your get out of jail free card, which is we did we did it for the transparency, um, and you can you can lean on that and say maybe it can't it doesn't scale to complexity which i think is a definite possibility just based on some of our discussions you have to know a fair amount like the cube scheduling module is not trivial at this point mostly because of backwards compatibility um so you got at least four concepts that have to kind of work but you know practically speaking most people just use the simplest version of those and if you can come if you can articulate it as and we can ignore everything that we don't recognize that actually mm -hmm. probably ends up being a net win for you like Maybe there are no tolerations or taints for locations. Do locations need taints or tolerations? Um, they might if we implement the equivalent of nodes going unready for uh, locations going unready. I, uh, I would want taints the same for the same reason I would want node taints to be able to drain or cordon or. If whatever we location. Scheduler, if we can reuse the scheduler there's a good chance that you can reuse enough of the predicates um i will say there have been a lot of bugs in that area where we just we made a few mistakes here and there and had to work around them when Any i mistakes, mentioned we should be fine <laughs> um I mean, just uh, just uh, um, about location selectors and not selectors. When I uh, mentioned the selectors uh, last week, I think I was mainly thinking about what um, Michael said, um, you know, about ACM uh, OCM. Uh, mainly, he's he's using, you know, um, uh, yes, labels, yes, correspondence of labels, and I was thinking of of something like, yeah, of course, initially at the at the the node level. A bit like Jason said, doing at the node level uh, something that is similar to what you have inside, you know, the affinity 
which is mainly uh, terms of of um, not selectors that you can you know group and, and stuff like that so I, I i was just thinking about is it something like that that we would want to have to you know define some sort of rule that drives um uh, um you know that that do the the correspondence between uh to to the between a location and the corresponding physical clusters um maybe and it's certainly a good argument uh you know a few of the use cases that we've come up with are you have to bind uh you have to have a concept representing a location that is an independent life cycle from the thing mm -hmm. that's providing it because a cluster yeah. can come and go and the location could be preserved a cluster should be able to be forcibly de if we're behaving like nodes a cluster should be able to be forcibly decommissioned um you know force delete all the instances make sure they're not coming back create a new one and mm -hmm. assign that location and the workload should come back um and you know the sinker the sinker should reconcile um so that would be uh, hey all of these are missing it's no different from existing so i, I do think that some set of a different set of concepts below the location level. Um, now, you know, an interesting thing, and it is kind of just came up is um, at some point, we're really a locations in this context isn't terribly dissimilar from a node and certainly virtual kubelet does this yeah. for things like Fargate and all these others uh, with EKS integration. And Microsoft mm -hmm. uh, did something like this for Azure and their virtual node. Like yeah. I could maybe see the argument that uh, we might be overcomplicating it, and a location can just be represented as the physical node object with inside a logical cluster, and everything just gets scheduled on one yeah. or two nodes. Um, I could see places where that might actually be more confusing, and that wouldn't map to other concepts. So, for instance, mm -hmm. if you wanted to do, um, if you wanted to bind, um, so as I think about this, like um, you could argue that location might be generic enough that you could use it for other constructs, and a node is just a uh, a duck type with location. So then oh, some of the attributes yeah. like labels and status um, and capacity might actually be shared. So then you could say, oh, well, you know, like we might have a, a different duck types of locations like Knative did. Um, and then the scheduler would work on any of them. Um, that's also an option. And you could actually make it work on node as well. I do feel it'd be confusing because the node object is a single thing and it means you know a node if you put two pods on a node it means something i do not think that abstraction is actually in place for the transparent multi-cluster use case now it might be inappropriate mm -hmm. to abstract a location or a part of a physical cluster as a single node um, i was always a little skeptical of that because you're you have a very specific object that you're now changing the meaning of yeah, yeah sure. and we want to sort through like what that means too so we, so we still might be might have to to build something at the cluster layer i mean um yeah well like uh we might have anyway. like we could have a node location or we could have a node pool or a node location pool or a like there might be other things that conceptually feel more uh, they are an abstraction mm. ideally we'd want to be able to think about how other types of placement problems could be solved so like uh I listed a couple of them out in another doc, and I was going to I was going to bring it up here under policy, but uh, teams placing uh, chunks of chunks of like a, a unit of something on a bunch of different clusters is a scheduling problem that would be nice if it's more general in a cube-like fashion, so that controllers could easily get uh, binding and placement on abstract capacity for free. That's kind of what Cube promised. Um, and so maybe there's an example there where we'd want to find the commonalities between, I want to place this database instance at a very coarse generic level on a set of locations, but that's scaling to more locations than transparent multi-cluster. Transparent multi-cluster is more like a like 05 mm. locations, whereas this might be 100 or 1000. Um, the scheduler would certainly have no problems with that. Would we want to use the same abstraction or not? I don't know. Mm. It's an interesting area of uh, sort of hacky prototyping of whether to get more comfortable with scheduling in general as a general concept. When, when trying to schedule some work to some locations, create some ephemeral node resources, try to schedule these resources to those nodes, 
and then take that determination and then feed that signal into the location scheduler. And so we get the we get node scheduling for free, but we don't have to call them nodes. Well, we and, can just and like so today in cube there's a few places that do this which take an existing cube object they have a aggregated api server virtual resource that transforms one object into another and for read-only objects that works really well you can also do that inside an informer so you talked about controllers and all that like it's trivial it's well, okay it's not trivial it is very easy today to use an informer of a concrete resource type and to translate that into a cache of things that are not like so say you um, uh scheduler does this a little bit uh openshift has a few controllers that do it so if you look at an ingress object or a um, a pod and instead of caching the pod or the ingress you cache a generic representation of it that's very simple um, that's actually pretty to do it's easy enough to do with the controller infrastructure not a lot of people do it but it's it's not a hard problem then you can actually build caches that are span multiple resource types more effectively so it's mostly useful when you have uh, you wanted to look at like all workload controllers and then turn them into mm. uh, some detail about their pod template. So like, hey, I can watch deployments, daemon sets, pods, replica sets, blah, 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 staple sets, anything, uh, third party jobs, index jobs, cron jobs. And of those, I can look at this very specific thing in the pod template and I need something that maps me from the generic object to the pod template. And then I can extract something from the pod template and only cache that so I can react when somebody somewhere creates a thing that's specific to the pod template both of those concepts kind of work together if we made it much easier to do virtual resources that subset an object you could absolutely potentially jason imagine taking a physical cluster and exposing a virtual resource that's like oh i can go look at whatever the underlying implementation is and return a and the sub resources do this too return a structured schema of a node for a location um, or return a set of nodes as locations and only give it access to some users. So that's another way to um, mm. do that transformation. Uh, it really depends on which client you're trying to hide it from. Trying you're muted. To... I think your, your AirPods are taking like three, four seconds to catch up, it looks like, when you start talking. So they just may be. My cat ate my AirPods yesterday, so I feel your pain. <laughs> Everything is terrible. Uh, mainly, I'm trying to avoid writing a scheduler from scratch. Right, I, I want to reuse and re and steal uh, as much as I can of already written code. Uh, whether that's uh, forking the node pod node scheduler. Uh, or fitting our use case into it or hiding it behind a facade that makes those decisions and then gives us location decisions. Um, I don't know exactly which one of those is going to be the most productive, but I definitely absolutely don't want to start with like nothing and start writing a scheduler because I'm not going to make it very hard. I think the the cube scheduler is reusable enough that if we can't make it work that's something that's a gap in cube it's not the primary goal of six scheduling to make it fully reusable yeah but if for instance there was a large set of ecosystem projects that wanted to do cube like scheduling the cube like way that is absolutely within scope of at least sig architecture to be like hey um we have a pretty powerful and relatively general cube scheduler. Are there parts of it that could be stubbed out for generic scheduling type problems on cube? And would six scheduling support it? Six so scheduling might be like people do a better job of supporting it, or it could just be a fork that inherits a lot of common libraries. I think that'd be well within reason for sure. Well, and I think I think you're I think you're making the case, and I think I'm believing you that locations are close enough to nodes that there's no reason there's no conceptual reason they shouldn't be close enough to work in in in, theory. in the scheduler if we were talking about uh, taking nodes and treating them as some other completely different thing like then i could see it but but i think i think you are convincing me that we're close enough we should try it a node nice. selector a taint a toleration an affinity rule and an anti-affinity rule, and then a set of things to place it on in a spec status system with a set of finite resource capacity pools. Like, 
Yeah, there's definitely special cases there. Yeah. But it's hard for me to argue that they're not just generic concepts to uh, yeah. something that would be usable across a set of placement decisions in, in cube language. Yeah. Mm. yeah, interesting. Uh, so once again, the, we have to extract the generic part from the rest. <laughs> a or, bit or, like or on the, in the core. Really, you know, I mean, certainly cube scheduler was one that we talked about moving out of cube um, into mm. its own repo. Again, a lot of those are kind of slowly moving because mm. you know it was it needs bodies on the ground. I do think there's people who would be very happy to help split the scheduler out and make it be reusable. And it mostly come, is the do we have a use case? Do we have a consumer? And do we have willing people? And the answer might be all, yes to all three of those if we get a little bit further in our investigation. Right, and the goal itself wouldn't just be to extract the code; it would be to make it duct typeable, generalizable, so that yeah. Nodes fit the duct type, locations fit the duct type. If anyone else wants some other thing to fit the duct type and, and make scheduling decisions. Yeah, I think that's I think that's uh, something we should look into and, and try. The I think it'll work. It's tantalizingly close to seeming like it will work. So we should try to make it work. The the real the only um I mean and the nice thing about the cube scheduler is from a performance and throughput placement decision, all of the O's on all the dimensions are much bigger than what we're talking yeah. about for some of these problems. Um, even people doing placement across lots of physical clusters, probably in the low tens of thousands or hundred thousands and sharding should be, again, like part of the goal of, ex like we have this on storage goals um, who are getting around to one of those other topics. It's like coming up with a way to let people who have a million problems effectively use um, a generic control plane like API server is well within bounds. Yeah, figuring out ways to shard on the on the problems is like the is like such a no brainer. Which like it's a problem that everybody has. What is your shard dimension, and where do you hit the limits? Like just forcing people to be up on a CRD. Like what shard dimension does this CRD make sense in? Uh, what is your key domain? It it's still hard for people, but. Everybody building anything has to come up with that shard dimension if we can formalize the pattern. Um, we, we want KCP to kind of evolve to be the rails of distributed systems, right? That's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's somewhere in like the, the blurbs. And so if you can take cube and then push it in those directions, sharding of O million scheduling topics also seems like something well within the bounds of what we would do. Yeah. Um... Okay. And Cube actually does support start sharding on scheduler names. Um, I know of a few people doing higher than three cardinality on schedulers on a single Cube cluster. Yeah. And almost all of them were sharding based things. Oh, okay. Uh, great. I, I want to move on from the scheduling topic because there's a lot, but I think this was very useful and uh we we probably want to figure out a way to like encode some of this in one of the investigation docs so that we can reference like hey like we because as you've been iterating jason like capture like a couple blurbs on like yeah. here's the the first investigation area and why we think it it's the most ideal from the working back to the principles or something yeah yeah good good call i will uh i will do that um i wanted to briefly hopefully briefly talk about uh, controllers in multi-tenant, or sorry, multi-cluster scenarios. So this was mm -hmm. something we've been, uh, we've been mainly focusing on the app use cases of here's a deployment, here's a service, here's a even a stateful set, things like that, um, where things that get sent down to the clusters don't have our back back to the API server and don't define CRDs and don't define cluster roles. These are things that would sort of bust outside of the uh, sinker bubble. Uh, if we sync down a CRD to a physical cluster, it might stomp on CRDs that are already defined in that cluster in a way that we don't want. Um, so, and that's tough for controllers because if you're going to give a logical cluster run this controller for me, usually that includes some CRD to watch. Usually that includes cluster roles, um, and usually includes watching all namespaces, which is something controllers shouldn't do from the physical cluster standpoint, they should do from the KCP, like the logical cluster standpoint. So I think we came up with a good solution to this. Me and Clayton talked last week, and I think the solution is we schedule the controller deployments down to physical clusters. If they specify a service account name, 
then we will inject a, a kube config that talks back up to the KCP where that CRD type is defined, where those cluster roles are defined, where that service account lives. And that controller won't talk to its lo local physical cluster API server. It will talk back up to KCP to watch for all objects I should be controlling or, or, or do what, create resources back up there. Um, the, so that solves the sort of tenancy problem at the cost of chattiness and latency from physical clusters up to KCP all the time. Um, I, I think this is a this unblocks us from being able to experiment more how much that is for real life controller uh, use cases. The ideal is that that uh, an off the shelf operator controller, something like Tecton, something like Knative, something like Argo CD, shouldn't need to be modified to work in a multi tenant. Or sorry, yeah, I'm saying multi tenant uh, shouldn't need to be have any modifications made to it to support. Multi-cluster, transparent multi-cluster is the goal. You should call this transparent cube uh, integration, or like figure out a way to take transparent multi-cluster and tack yeah. on cube integration, like transparent multi-cluster yeah. cube integration or something. Yeah, right? it, and it might be multi-cluster, right? The controller right. could be, the deployment in the controller could be annotated to say, split me across, you know, replicate me across five clusters for, for HA, the same way that the app deployment could be. Um, but the, the trick is yeah. that... So, yeah, excuse me. Uh, just to understand correctly, um, you are speaking about controllers that would be living, I mean, or you know, uh, in in physical clusters, uh, and that would contact KCP to possibly watch on several logical clusters, right? Uh, Is the, the, what you're speaking of? Uh, to talk back to, right? So the so. Not to talk across multiple logical clusters, to talk only to the logical cluster in which that controller was installed. So okay. installing a controller is just define some CRDs, create a deployment that, when it starts, watches for types of that CRD. Or yeah, isn't it a bit what what has been already uh, down with you know when we use the deployment splitter in and and the sinker in push mode? I mean in pull mode. Sorry. Uh, uh, a bit, yeah. So, so the same, we will inject the same kube config into controllers running in physical clusters that the sinker mm -hmm. uses to talk to KCP, basically. Uh, yeah, the, the thing is that for now, you we were ejecting the kube config with, you know, <laughs> uh, mainly kube admin or, or something like that. Uh, and that's, in fact, you would just uh, set up things to provide precisely the sufficient uh, minimal rights to the controller running on your physical cluster to access the KCP, uh, just uh, uh, only have access to the the right resources. Right? Is it is it is it what you are? Yeah, it it shouldn't have. It doesn't need to have any access or even connectivity to the local API server. It only needs to talk back up to the logical cluster uh, yeah. level, to list things, and create yeah. things. Sure. Out of 100% of use cases for Cube today, more than 5% of them, or around 5% of them, are want to run a controller that exposes CRD that does something in the clustered context that I am in. And mm. so, specifically, that use case, which is not a multi logical cluster and it is not a, it yeah. doesn't have, it's not a multi physical cluster. It is, I want to create a deployment and get a controller running against CRDs. And I expect to be able to use service account injection to make that work. It is specifically addressing that case. The, the key point is you're not integrating with the physical cluster because transparent multi-cluster hides physical clusters from the end user. Right. Physical mm -hmm. cluster exists to host workloads. The control plane of the physical cluster is explicitly partitioned to improve security mindset, which would be for all the class of applications that don't care mm -hmm. about the cluster they're on. Then you have isolation. And this type of controller needs a cluster. It doesn't need the cluster. Right. So anybody else coming into that logical cluster would be able to be like, oh, I want to create a, I want to create one of those instances of CRDs. Great. The controller's running in that logical cluster. Great. I don't care. So that's like local, that's testing controllers, that's um, iterative development, that's a team building their own controllers and running them mm -hmm. for themselves, where they just want the controller to be running and they expect it to work as well as Cube. So principle of least surprise for a Cube yeah. user who's building an integration. Okay, so, um, well, since I didn't have the whole you know, discussion before, so I'm not sure. 
I'm trying to grasp the, the, the idea, but if I take an example, um, uh, I would take the example of, of um, quadratic workspaces, <laughs> you know, the, the future app studio, one part of, of some part of it at least. And for quadratic workspaces, the new approach of it is mainly based on a, on a dev workspace uh, customer source that then at some point uh, through a controller is, tr is translated into a deployment. And what I discussed with some of the people of the COW team some times ago is that if we wanted to apply that, which I would like when, when the rebase is finished, um, to try that uh, running on KCP, mainly um, I assumed that the deployment that is generated from the dev workspace uh, customer source would not really have access to the customer resource itself because you know uh, the customer resource mainly if i understand correctly would live on at the kcp uh controller is not going to implicitly have access to anything other than the logical cluster to the kcp instance that's what okay so, so that controller is not going to have access to the physical cluster exactly so my question was um so obviously i understood correctly what you were, were meaning so what, what you're saying is that the deployment that will be running physically on the physical cluster, um, but the context, I mean, the cube context, let's say, in which the deployment or the service account, uh, anyway, um, uh, in which the deployment is running and the pod, uh, underlying pod is running. Finally, when it, it you know, it um, inside the pod, uh, if, you, if you try to look for a customer resource, uh, of the type dev workspace you would transparently see the the the, the customer resource but in fact uh, the customer resource would be living in the uh, on the kcp layer and in the same logical cluster that that initially gave life to the deployment am i when right you start a pod a pod automatically yeah. has injected three things service account token at var run kubernetes io yeah. service yeah. account yeah. Yeah. slash token as a namespace file mm -hmm. populated with the contents of the namespace, and it has a set of environment variables set, Kubernetes underscore service underscore host, the kube yeah, client yeah, yeah, library, yeah, sure. implicit, yeah, yeah. Like the implicit context. The pod running on the physical cluster would have Kubernetes service host pointing at the KCP, the KCP. instance. Yes, OK, I see. Namespace would be set mm -hmm. to the namespace of the KCP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, that where the controller was, yeah. and the token would be injected, generated back. Then. And like, there's treated as a black box. The as you said, the implicit service, the implicit cube config, versus like an explicit cube config, yeah, yeah, sure. points to the KCP instance where the controller ran, and that's mediated by the syncer. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I was not aware of that we were there according to this, but that's great. Then that relieves and relaxes the the, the constraints that are quite hard and that I had yeah. spoken to to the COW team. Uh, this this was a this was a, a bit of a source of anxiety for me as well because if we if we support the app case but don't support controllers, don't have a good support for them, then we're we're not going to get very far. But I think yeah, that because... an elegant and relatively small change, a relatively small injection of of information to be able yeah, to support yeah, this yeah, yeah. for multi cluster. And it's transparent oh. multi-cluster too. And that's the yeah, yeah. distinction. That's why we have to do that. And sure. over this yeah. is yeah. we are not supporting by default the idea that the controller you run would implicitly run on the underlying cluster. That's against transparent multi-cluster. Yeah. There yeah. might be a mechanism where someone takes a sinker and forks it in a non-transparent mm -hmm. multi-cluster use case. And that was the discussion with um uh with Michael last time, which was that is the opposite of the transparent multi-cluster use case. <laughs> that is someone materializing objects onto a Kubernetes cluster with the express intent of changing the behavior of that Kubernetes cluster. So those two use cases are duals. They might share the same code. They might have similar concepts, but they are not the same use case. And so mm -hmm. the use case we just described as a transparent multi-cluster use case. And then maybe we should come up with like a clever name for non-transparent multi-cluster, like explicit multi-cluster or uh, command and control multi-cluster, something clever. Um, yeah. Transparent, when you deploy something, doesn't change the underlying cluster. Yeah. The other one, you do, you're explicitly trying to change the underlying cluster in, an, in a non-transparent uh, way, which means you could have side effects. So transparent multi-cluster is supposed to be side effect free. 
mm. giving a controller access to the physical cluster is absolutely not side effect free. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's great because that, that seemed a, a very, well, while speaking with, with them, with the other architects of the COW team, that seemed really a very hard um, requirement that you have to, you know, have um, strong borders between layers, uh, uh, between what is at the app level inside KCP or the customer source level, and then what is um uh, on the physical cluster level which is mainly you know generated uh, workloads and that you would only be able to you know go top to down uh but not the way around and you, you would not be able to dis discuss from a pod to the customer source that that was at the originated it's so yeah. jason when we record this in the transparent multi-cluster we should describe explicit multi-cluster or whatever as the dual and like have that in there is that something you can do or you want me to do it uh i can do it i think i uh, uh i want to write a doc specifically about controllers and how they are like here is the explicit way to do it is to have to modify the controller or to have another sidecar controller that knows how to schedule things to multiple clusters the implicit way is to give it to kcp kcp transparently distributes that work but to be able to do that, you have to talk to KCP. So that's sort of the, uh, that's the summary. I will write more words around that to make it, uh, to make it more real. But yeah, I think, I think it was, it was a, a relief to me to, to realize there was a way around this because I think it had also been, I've been thinking about it in the context of Tecton, uh, but code ready workspaces absolutely would have the same problem. Any controller would have exactly the same problem. And that opens the door then for the next discussion, which we're not quite at yet, which is, um, and I would probably call this like, it's the evolution of logical cluster, which is if you have all these logical clusters, you want a way to deal with them in bulk because that helps you build more effective control integrations because one logical cluster is even smaller than a real physical cluster. One of the benefits of a physical cluster is you install one API and one controller and it can work for lots of tenants. We need the equivalent tenant idea for extensions added to a logic multi-cluster. There's a side, I've got a side doc I've been working on with Jessica, which explores some ideas like Mm -hmm. uh, the flexibility that logical clusters give us would allow us to have different API instances in each, that's the APIs and, and the behavior. But the next step is that you'd be able to tie different implementations to them, which would allow you as an organization to roll out the implementation of a new controller mm -hmm. in a controlled fashion across different chunks of things. Mm -hmm. So a team might be able to opt in to upgrading between two incompatible versions of an API or swapping yeah. open source uh, implementation of a controller to a vendor implementation or vice versa. Mm. Um, I'll have a separate doc for that. I wasn't actually able to get the policy doc pushed. It looks like GitHub's back now, so we can stop saying that, but, claiming we're un unproductive. Um, I did want to spend a few minutes talking about that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But, just, just a question, because that's very interesting also, I mean, but really workspace is wide because I, <laughs> that's where I come from. But but yes, uh, it has always been very um, painful to, you know, uh, because you have only one cluster wide customer source. You mean you have a single tenant, which is and, very painful yeah, to deal with for, because singletons are inflexible. Exactly, for everyone. And, and precisely in such a case where, you know, you have mainly one deployment um, coming from one uh, dev workspace uh, customer source then you can have all the pods from those deployments running on the same physical cluster but they would each be tied to a distinct uh, customer version of the customer source uh, living in a distinct um, uh, logical cluster yeah. and it seems to me that this we would nearly be i mean of course pro probably not completely transparently but at least we would be able to to test that if we have the even a manual uh, minimal implementation of this secret injection uh, to pods that we just spoke of, uh, then this would probably open the door to testing uh, this, even if it's a bit manual, but at least, you know, having a proof of concept of, of something like already workspaces. Um, working in several logical clusters with different distinct APIs and having all the workloads being pushed to a given a distinct physical cluster. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, 
anything, Jason, you want to cover before we switch over to policy? Nope, go ahead. Hit most of the things. Um, okay, so policy, I did push um, a brief investigation doc. So this one's a little bit shorter than the other ones. Um, I tried to list all the different areas. So this is uh, 142. So I just got that open because GitHub came back. Um, let me link that in the GitHub issue for the agenda. And um, just so people can find it. Uh, so uh, this is just highlighting the idea. So like we had like we've had four invest or three investigation topics so far. We had minimal API server, which we've all spent a little bit of time, but we're mostly spending you on getting use cases from breath and prototyping that would come back. And we had uh, logical clusters and transparent multi-cluster. And those kind of sit on top of minimal API server. Self-service policy kind of sits on top of logical clusters. So this is the concept that if you want to break a big mega cube, so today people have big mega cube clusters because it's super efficient to just add one more team. But the downside of it is there's no hard po policy boundaries between namespaces. So everybody in the ecosystem has gone through like 50 different iterations and all of them have trade-offs. Um, logical clusters were exploring a different, that tried to combine like three problems at once, APIs and having different sets of APIs available, breaking the, the monolith of a cube API server into a set of chunks that are mm. more discrete uh, and enabling reuse and plug points that would allow you to virtualize the implementation of things like RBAC or quota so that you could actually have higher organizational mm. scale. So the, the observation is anyone getting really deep into cube uh, has lots of it. Um, the lots of it requires you today to build a layer on top, which is totally reasonable, but everybody's building many of the same layers in different ways, so there's no alignment. So the self-service policy is, is there a pattern or set of patterns that are reasonably broad enough in the cube ecosystem that we could holistically address building on logical clusters and the capabilities we've been talking about for minimal API server that gives an organization kind of a 80% batteries included approach for building self-service directly into a control plane that sits in front of their application infrastructure. So team user in comes in based on who that user is. They're able to um, ask for a set of capacity, which has a set of controls. Uh, that set of capacity might be a logical cluster, might be multiple logical clusters, for the sake of art, could be a set of APIs. So what APIs does this type of user have access to? Can they create clusters? Can they create mm. infrastructure? Can they only deploy pods? Can they only use higher level constructs like Tecton and Knative? Could they only use mm -hmm. higher level CRDs like 12 factor apps that look like a Heroku resource? Could they only use function, like very, very generic functions with extremely specific rules. <laughs> That's different sets of APIs, but the policy would be, how could you get that self-service? And um, what are the controls and policy constraints? So laying out the docs, pretty short, but it just lays out a bunch of investigation areas. Um, the intent would be um, over the next couple of weeks, I wanna, we, I've got a couple of big, I've got a simple example and a big example. The idea would be we prototype a little bit of a simple example of you can go to a KCP instance and you can create a CRD that says logical cluster. I'm not, I'm not going to get any more detail than that. And then that results in you being able to hit a logical cluster, get access, get a set of APIs for it. And then that would play into the other two demos for transparent multi-cluster. But it also kind of demonstrate kind of logical cluster as an implementation detail where the API is pluggable. So there'd be a simple example. And at the same time, um, we're going through and, and trying to write up a doc of a very complex, full, what an enterprise or service provider or very large company would use where they have tens of thousands of application teams. Could you come up with a, a policy system architecture that hits the 80% case for most people most of the time could go to something that feels a lot like Cube, they get an open source project where they can say, I want to I'm this person, that person gets mapped into some organizational structure for the set of allowed capacity. They can self-service and get a logical cluster. And we might come up with a different name for it. Thinking workspace was kind of the, the name we were playing around with. Um, and that's been something we've been using in internal discussions. And then in that workspace would be a set of APIs and a set of rules. The administrator would have a set of cube-like policies that it could apply to all of those. And then the tenancy boundaries could be imposed. So 
in the same way that Cube standardized deployment of containerized apps, it's not the best and wasn't perfect, but it was good enough and covered a broad enough set of use cases, could we do the same thing for policy? Um, so this is an exploration. That second doc will be a much more advanced example, but it would be a modular system where, uh, just like we talked about with KCP splitting out like these different sub elements as we go from prototype to maybe project, some of it will go into cube, some of it will be separate. Um, this would be like its own module where you could reuse the implementation. You could take the implementation and fork it and add your own rules, or you could build controllers around it that feel very natural for doing multiple hierarchical policy that satisfies the general case of I'm a company or a large organization that has lots and lots of teams and I want to use cube-like tools, GitOps, CRDs, controllers, have my own extensions. And I want to get, um, I want that to be deeply integrated with my application infrastructure so that I can say things like, you know, oh, backstage IO could just transparently plug into this and they wouldn't have to worry about their service. Like, that was just an example that we came up with. And I'll put that, I actually forgot to put that in the examples, but it's like working through that story of, could you do the same thing for organizational self-service that Cube did for deployment learning from the examples um, like you know all the way back to cloud foundry and heroku um, you know what are the concepts that everybody reinvents the wheel on that if we can do just enough batteries included and have just enough pluggability to uh ldap to uh, iam to cloud services that you could basically say like this is the front door for all your app teams and it's flexible enough that most people can just use it out of the box and then plug their layer on top and therefore we've abstracted some complexity for for uh, teams everywhere. So ambitious, I know. That's the fourth avenue of investigation <laughs> for us. Yeah, nice. I like, uh, I haven't, I obviously haven't read any of this, but your description was very good. Uh, I think we will find, I think flexibility is gonna be key both for this and transparent multi-cluster. I think we've talked about transparent as if everyone wants transparent. And I think there are some people that absolutely want fine grain control over everything. I think it's the same on self-service. Definitely some people want self-service. A team should be able to show up and get cluster capacity without having to fill out you know, forms in triplicate or anything. But some organizations would absolutely not want self-service well, to be an easy, like teams can just show up without talking to. Yeah, I, I think there's a nuance here that's uh, that I was I glossed over, but it's very good that you caught that, Jason. So um, every large enterprise organization has a system for controlling access to resources. Yeah. So. Every single person at every single one of these companies hates those, which is why they got so heavily invested in bringing a credit card to the cloud, mm. which is why we created an unsustainable sprawl in the cloud that made a lot of money for everybody involved because you're trading money for operational flexibility. What the kind of evolution of the problem now is, is you still have all the requirements, right? You have to physically divide up limited capacity to a set of users. Uh, but now you have to do it over even more places than you did before because now you have like hundreds of cloud accounts that you have no idea where the spend is. I don't think we're trying to tackle all of the parts of the problem. We still want to give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, like we want in an enterprise environment, you're going to have a system of record. What we want to offer is a better place to plug in so that you get a bunch of stuff for free. And most people's knobs exist on that system. So in your case, the one you're bringing up, Jason, would be you start off with zero quota, someone creates the workspace, and it can go into a ticketing flow. And the ticketing mm -hmm. integration between the act of creating it and, and um, ServiceNow, super trivial. That's yeah. the kind of uh, escape patch for what you're describing. Mm -hmm. Not everyone will pick that, but most people have this problem and they all have different ways of solving it, which means everyone who wants to improve this has to invent all the parts of the solution themselves. Trying to find the, uh, the Venn diagram overlap of the things that everybody needs that can enforce some standard rules, that's kind of the hope, so. Yeah, um, awesome. Thank you for that. I will read this immediately after this. I'll post the recording soon. And have a good week, everyone. For your information, I'll be on PTO next week, the two next weeks. OK. Great. See you. Have fun. See you. Bye.